I invite the congregation to turn to Genesis chapter 42. <clears throat> I'm going to be looking at a series of messages focusing on the life of Joseph. And as we dig into his life and as God has opened his life to each one of us through scripture, that we can learn and uh, how, how to face some, some times that we really don't want to face, those difficult times in our life. And I just sense an uneasiness in our society today. You guys sense the same thing? There's a lot of questions. You know, they, they wonder, what, what, what is the future going to hold? You know, you, you got the war drums beating with, with Russia and, and China and North Korea, and you got Ukraine involved in all of that. You got our economy that really isn't as great as what the media says it is, right? The media makes it sound like, hey, we're all millionaires. But, but that's not that great. You know, churches are struggling. People are in pain. And, and people are, I just, as I meet people in my day to day activities, it just seems like there's just a, an uneasiness, a, a concern. But who's in control? God. God is. But as we look at Joseph this morning, we're going to see that it wasn't always easy for him either. And, and how do we handle those, those difficult times? In the movie Forrest Gump, how many like that show? <laughs> Yep. His lifelong friend Jenny had endured a childhood of abuse and neglect. And if you remember that scene in the movie, Forrest and Jenny visit her old house. And Forrest watches Jenny throw stone after stone at the weather-beaten old house, which held so many painful memories for her. She'd pick up a stone and just throw it at the house. And when she finally quit throwing the rock, she just began to cry. You can almost feel the pain that she had. And Forrest said, sometimes there just aren't enough rocks. <laughs> you feel that way? You know, we have those times in our life like we've been hurt, we've been discouraged, we've been down, and we just don't know what to do. And for Jenny, it was helpful for her just to throw some rocks. But sometimes there's just not enough rocks, are there? In a book entitled Head Trash, I was reading that a couple weeks ago, and I was, as I'm reading this book, there are five emotional wounds that we all suffer from. Number one is betrayal. We have all been lied to at one time in our life, or we've had someone in our life that didn't live up to the expectations that we wanted them to live up to. Has anybody had faced betrayal in their life? The second chapter that I was reading, it talks about injustice. How many of us here have had that point in life when someone has done wrong to us and wanted to hurt us? The third one that I was, was reading about is called humiliation. And we've all had the, those people in our lives that, that want to criticize us. That want to make us feel inferior. To treat us with disrespect and to push us down. To humiliate us. Have any of us been in that point? And the last one is rejection. And as I read this book, this is probably one of the hardest ones. We've all had someone that not, didn't show up for something, a plan, an appointment, a date. Someone that pushed us aside because of who we are. Someone that wanted to really disconnect us from life and to hurt us. How many here have been rejected? Pastor of a mansion was a pastor that I grew up with when I was in junior high school. And I remember him saying when I went to seminary, he said, Brad, he said, I want to tell you something. And it's something that I would never forget. He says, in every church pew is a broken heart. When you go to preach on a Sunday morning, realize that in every church pew, there's a broken heart. And I believe that is true. And this morning, as we meet Joseph, as we look into his life, we see a simple statement that says, when Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. And when he recognized his brothers, what did that do to him and his heart? So Genesis chapter 42, beginning at verse 7. Listen to God's word. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he what? Recognized. He recognized them. 
but he pretended to be a stranger and he spoke oh, harshly. Yeah, listen to that. He recognized who they were and he didn't come to them and say, oh, my brother, I haven't seen for a while. What did he do? He spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. We're from the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph, what? Recognized. He recognized him again. He recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them, and he said to them, You are a bunch of spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. Now his brothers are filled with fear, and he said, No, no, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are the sons of one man. Your servants are what? Honest, honest men and not spies. Okay. You see that word honest? Remember that. No, he said to them. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied again, out of fear. Your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one and there was one who is no more. And then Joseph said to him a third time, Just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. And if you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified, and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, can you imagine these guys that are filled with fear? Surely we are being punished because of our brother. So what are they being punished for? Their brother Joseph, who they put in a pit and sold, right? We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded for us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why there's this distress that has come upon us. Now Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you would listen? Now we are here giving an accounting for his blood. And they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep. But then turned back and spoke to them again. <coughs> he had Simon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack and to give them provisions for their journey. And after this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. At the place they stopped for a night, they opened the sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of the sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here is my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other, trembling, and said, What is this that God has done for us? Wow, what an awesome story. A story that we can all place our lives into. <laughs> Initially, we see how Joseph responded facing up to his brothers. The Bible said he spoke harshly to them. But the bottom line is pain triggers our emotion, right? It did for Joseph and it does for you and me. And yet Joseph is the guy here that is feeling the pain when he recognizes his brothers. And he thinks of all the evil things that his brothers did to him. So this morning, for just a little bit of time, let's take a look at Joseph's life and look at this scripture passage and how to place it in our own. invisible to our eyes, but it's not invisible to God's eyes. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Men and women look at the face, but God looks at the heart. heart. Isn't that amazing? In Genesis chapter 42, let us look at Joseph's heart for just a moment from his viewpoint that we can learn just a little bit about our heart 
and how we can be healed. So what are the steps that God wants us to take to, to look at our heart? First one, we need to step up and face our pain. Verse 7 and 9, it talks about how Joseph recognized his brothers, and when he recognized them again, all the memories of the past came back to him, and that had to be very painful. <clears throat> Twice in this passage we read, Joseph recognized them. It's obvious that Joseph knew that he would have to face up to his brothers at some time in his life. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, Scripture tells us that Joseph was 17 years old when his brothers sold him to those slave traders, okay? And likewise, in the previous chapter, we read that Joseph was 30 when he was placed in this position as prime minister of Egypt. So in the meantime, there were seven good years of harvest and seven, year, uh, seven years of famine. So if you do all the math, I'm kind of confusing you here, but we're not quite sure how many years passed by that it was from the time that Joseph was sold until he faced his brothers again. But you can figure it, it's, Joseph is 37 years old now. There's about 20 years went by. Now think about that. Two decades have passed. He saw his brothers and he recognized them. And you say, well, Brad, that, that, that was a long time ago that, that he had to face that pain. That, 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 that's 20 years. But let me ask you, do you remember the pain that you experienced 20 years ago? I do. Absolutely. Do you remember the people that hurt you, that cut you apart? Let's take it a little bit further. How long ago was it that you were in high school, Mike? <laughs> yeah, good luck, man. Good luck. I graduated in 87. 87. So that's about uh, a long time ago, 36 years ago. Exactly. Like that. Exactly. That's Thank you, by you, the way. You were old as dirt. You know? <laughs> now, do you remember anything that has happened in high school, some of the pain that you experienced in high school? Some I still remember a lot of it, yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah, it is. How that sticks in your mind? You say, well, Brad, that's a long time. And it's a long time for Mike. It's even longer for me. But <laughs> you still remember that, right? <clears throat> so now I, I look at Joseph here. 20 years have went by, and he recognizes his brother, and he still feels the hurt. You, you were the guys that put me in the pit. You were the guys that wanted to kill me. You were the guys that were jealous of my coat of many colors. You were the guys that sold me into slavery. You were the guys. It wasn't something that he forgot. He still lived it daily. And when he recognized his brothers, there is no question why he dealt with them harshly, right? You know, a lot of time had passed. A lot of pain had been endured. Joseph, he endured slavery, he endured prison, all the problems stemming from his brother's choices. Now he had time to face them face to face, and he could address his abusers. He'd come face to face with the boys who sold him, and some of them even wanted to slaughter him. And if it wouldn't have been for Reuben's suggestion to keep him alive and sell him, Joseph would have been dead. But then in verse 9, we read something else very interesting. After seeing his brother, not only did he speak harshly to them, the Bible says that he remembered the dreams which he had about them. We remember what's done in the past, but sometimes he remembers in those dreams what his brothers did to him, throwing him in the pit, selling him. How many times when we have those bad days, when we have those discouraging days, we lay down in bed and remember some of the crap that's happened on the past? You ever had that happen? So that's what was happening in Joseph's life. He was laying in bed and he could never forgive them. In the night, his subconscious mind would dream about his brothers. The bottom line here is that he had many nightmares about them and also many daytime memories about them. And what's really interesting is that it was his dreams and the interpretations of Pharaoh's dreams that got him to the palace. And yet all the time, Joseph was struggling with his own nightmares. 
God recorded this in Scripture because he wants us to know that God is never absent or ignorant about our pain. He doesn't devalue our pain. He doesn't just say, oh, that's just a little thing. In fact, God knows our pain, and I want you to know that today. Listen, if you have a broken heart, if you're lost and you're confused, God knows that. In Psalm 56, verse 8, it's a beautiful passage. It says, God, you keep track of all of my sorrows. You have collected all of my tears in your bottle. Think about that. All the tears that you've shed in your life, God has collected for you. You have recorded each one in your book. You want to know where God is when you're hurting and when you're broken? He's right next to you. Just like he was for Joseph. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. He is the shepherd of our hearts and souls, and he is right there. He knows what our breaking points are, but he also knows how to restore us when we're cast down. Sometimes the process may seem like, boy, this is taking a long time. Yet God wants to restore us to health and strength. One thing that I do know about pain is it takes time to process through it. You know, sometimes in our society, oh, you were hurt. Oh, hey, you're all better now. Go on your way, right? That's not the way it works with pain. Cindy, I'm sure you see that with the students that you work with. Something that has happened to your students Ten years ago, it's still painful in their lives today. There is no shortcut in restoring and healing our wounds. David said this in Psalm 109. My heart is wounded within me. My heart is broken. Internal wounds are a lot worse than external wounds. You know, our little cups that we have in our hands, that usually heals up pretty quickly. But the wounds of the heart always linger a lot longer. So as I was thinking about this with Joseph, for years God was preparing Joseph to see his brothers again. God had him going through the process to restore his brother and to heal the wounds of his brothers. God is kind of like that great physician, slowly, slowly helping us to heal. And that's why it says in 1 Peter, we're supposed to call, cast all of our cares upon him. God's process of healing our wounds is twofold. It requires special attention and time. We need to look at what's broken our heart, but it takes time. The same is true when it comes to our emotional wounds. It takes time and attention. We have to deal with our pain. If your heart is bruised and broken today, do like Joseph. Just, just turn it over to God. Because God's desire is to heal us and to deliver us and to make us better and to make us stronger. Step up and face the new day, each step in the process that God takes us through. When we're going through these troubling times and people say, oh, what's going to happen? I know what's happening. It's all in God's hands, right? Trust God and let him work through your pain. The second step is try not to sidestep your pain. And you may say, what? You know, don't run away from pain. You know, we're taught what well, everything's gonna be okay, everything's gonna be be better. We teach I teach our kids when they're little, when they cut themselves, oh, you know, <clears throat> we'll put a band-aid on it, and everything will be better, right? But pain is good. <coughs> What I'm saying is that there is benefit in pain. Teaching a child about fire. They touch fire once, are they going to touch it again? No, that's right. Because it, it hurts, right? I can tell you from personal experience that pain has been good in my life. And it's been in those times of pain, it's been in those times of struggle that I've grown close to my Lord and Savior. We live in a world that tries to run away from pain, but I think we need to live in a time where we face our pain. If we would have never went through the farm crisis in the early 80s, 
or my dad lost his farm and lost everything. I want to never become a pastor. It was painful at the point. I hated it. But God showed me something greater. I look at some of the pain that I've endured through, through the ministry and, and working in churches and working with people. It hurts at times. But that pain has made me stronger. We got two athletes sitting right there. Does pain make you better? Yeah. When you when you're running and you you try to in soccer, right? Yeah. Okay. When your legs start to hurt, does the coach say, oh, "Okay, it's it's okay. Your legs hurt. You can sit down," or does he push you even further? <laughs> no, you got to keep going, right? <laughs> That's it. Pain is all right because it makes us stronger. In verses 11 through 24. I get this. We are the sons of one man. We are honest men, they say. Your servants are not spies. Now, who are they talking to? Joseph, right? You think Joseph sees them as good guys? You think Joseph sees them as honest people? And then as we read the conversation between Joseph and his brothers, something should strike you immediately. Notice how the brothers introduce themselves. Notice they say, we're honest. We're good guys. Good people. We love God, and we do the right things. Now, if you're Joseph standing and listening to this, you're thinking, yeah, right. Here they are introducing themselves to Joseph, and immediately notice, what do they do? They lie. In verse 13, they say, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the son of a man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and the younger is no longer alive. Who are they standing in front of? The one that's alive, right? <laughs> Do you see what they're doing? They're perpetuating a lie that they told their dad 20 years before, and they're sticking to that story. They're refusing to come clean, and yet in poetic justice, the person that they're saying is dead is standing right smack in front of them. And then as the story progresses, Joseph demands that Benjamin be brought to him and throws all of them, but one of them, in prison, the same prison that Joseph was living in for several years. It's strange, isn't it? And then he sends his brothers off to go get Benjamin. And then yet notice what happens in the meantime. The brothers get honest, right? They look at verse 21, they send to another, Truly we're guilty of our brother because we saw the distress on his face, when he was pleading with us. Now, here they are. They're going to visit with Joseph. Joseph. They don't know who Joseph is. And all of a sudden they're starting to think, guys, do you remember the look on our little brother's face when we threw him in the pit? Do you remember the panic on his face when we ripped his coat apart and dipped it in blood? Do you remember the panic on his face when he heard us talking about Let's kill him. Then we changed our mind, and you remember the panic on his face when we tied him up and sold him to a bunch of slave traders? Do you remember his face? And all of a sudden, they're reliving all of this. And Reuben, the guy that says, really, we need to save his life, was saying, now we're facing the reckoning for his blood. Ah. Oh. As I look at the scripture passage, you see what's happening? God is at work. He's convincing. He's dealing with their hearts. He is at work in the brothers' hearts. Not only do they come face to face with their brother, they're coming face to face with God. They created pain. They too probably have lived with that pain and guilt for 20 years, what they did to their little brother. They probably walked up to their father, and their father was still crying because he lost his son. At their hands. Can you imagine the guilt and the pain that even they were living with? And all of a sudden, God's working in their life. The pain in their heart is starting to come out. Have you ever been in that place where God is working in your life and he's stirring your heart? I think we all have. That point in our life where God is 
is changing and moving and, and causing us to think of things and thinking of the things that we've done in the past. And it's painful. And he starts working your heart. And what do we got to deal with that? Do with that pain? We got to deal with it, right? And likewise, God was working in Joseph's heart. He was a man that they thought was an Egyptian. Say something dumbfounding. He said in verse 18, I fear God. Now, if you look at the Hebrew here, it's Elohim. It's the God of the Israelites. It's not the God of the Egyptians. It's not some foreign God. This was the God that they even worshipped. And I wonder if they caught that. He is really saying to his brothers, I believe in God, I respect God, and I have the fear of God. You see, God was also working in his heart. So this is what I, we really need to focus on this. God was at work in his brothers as they were being convicted. God was working in the pain of both the brothers and Joseph to do something great. God was at work in their pain. And let me tell you, when you lay down in bed, in bed at night and your heart is stirring, you feel that you need to do something, you're called to help someone, you're called to make things right, you're called to forgive, whatever it is, God is moving you. By golly, you better do it. When God moves your heart, when he's working through that pain, God is saying, I just want to heal you. I want to make it better. How many are familiar with uh, the name Corrie ten Boom? Yeah. She was a woman that suffered in the concentration camps under Nazi control because she was the one that helped the Jews escape the Nazis during the Holocaust of World War II. Corrie was a great writer and speaker. She told her story all over the world. Yet little did she know that one day she would come face to face with one of the prison guards who persecuted her. You see, he was at a church in Munich. He showed up to her talk, and it talks about her experience here. Corey says, I remember him. She recognized him, just like Joseph recognized his brothers. Now, can you imagine the, the, the emotions that this would bring? She says, I remembered him, and, lay, and I, ceased, I still see the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I'd been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze, she said. The man came up to her and talked to her. He said, you, re you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. I was a guard there, he said. And he was thinking that she didn't recognize him, but she certainly did recognize him. But he said, I've come to talk to you. He says, since that time, I've become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me for all the cruel things I did there. And I just want to come to you and say, I'm sorry. And to hear that you forgive me. Fraulein, he says, will you forgive me? And Corey says, I stood there. She said, my blood was cold. She said, I remember my sister Betsy, who died in that place at his hands. She said, how could I forgive him for such terrible things that he did to my to sister and to my family? She said, it felt like hours that I stood there. His hand was held out to me, but I didn't take it. I wrestled with the most difficult thing that I ever had to do to forgive a guy that destroyed But I had to do it. I knew I had to do it. Because that's the message of God's forgiveness. That there are no prior conditions. That we forgive those who have injured us. Wow. It's hard to forgive. I don't like to forgive. I like to hold on to grudges. I like to have my little pity parties. And I like to say how, I, how I've been harmed and hurt. And I like to point fingers and say, look at that person. She hurt me. They talked bad about me. They wanted to hurt my ministry. Oh, I like to hold on to grudges and I don't like to forgive. I'll be honest there. But God says, forgive. 
You see, God is always at work in wounds and pain and scars. Think about the cross that Christ carried for us. The greatest work was done through Christ's death on the cross. The scars and the pain that he endured on the cross, it was for us. God did not waste the pain that Jesus faced. The pain was for us. And God does not waste the pain that we go through as well. The Bible says God will intersect your pain. And as I look back in my life, I know that God has blessed me so many times when I've been hurting and crying. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians. In our trouble, God comforts us. you believe that? And this too, to help us. To show you from our personal experience how God wants to comfort us when we undergo suffering. And he will give you the strength to endure. God expects you to use your pain to help others. And whatever mistake you've done in the past, whatever failure or trial or bad decision you made, God is there saying, Mike, I forgive you, man. Tanika, I forgive you. Kristen, I forgive you, and I'm going to use it for my glory. God doesn't want us to waste our hurt. He wants to redeem us and build us up. And you know what I found? I can help a lot, lot more people and share with a lot more people in my weakness than through my strength. Because you know what? People don't want to hear how great we are, do they? They don't want to hear about all of our accomplishments or how many buildings, Bob, did you build in your lifetime? People don't want to hear about, oh, look at your Camaro. Oh, it's a really cool Camaro, by the way. Yeah, yeah. You know? But what do people really want to hear in our world today? I think there's a longing to hear about Christ. And when we're weak, when we can come to people and say, you know what, Mike, I've been where you've been at. They're going to listen. They don't want someone who is cocky and proud, who has all the answers, come to them and say, hey, this is what we can do to help. They want to see people also who have experienced the same pain. God has comforted us. And God expects us to help others, even through our own failures and trials. God does not want to waste your hurt. So, you know, telling people of all the good things that you've done won't help them in their pain. But when you can say, I've been there, they'll listen. And the last thing, step out of the cage of pain. Like I said earlier, I love pity parties. My family hates it. You know, Carla doesn't like it when I'm throwing my little pity party around. They can tell immediately. They can tell immediately when I walk in the house at night what my day has been like. And then, oh, Carl, feel bad for me. Make me a big supper. <laughs> you know? Pity parties, it's not where it's at. we got to step out of that cage of pain. we got to do what God has called us to do. And that's what we see at the end of this story. How did Joseph bless his brothers? He even gave them more. He gave them their silver back. You know, so often in this world, there are so many people who refuse to be healed. It's easy to be paralyzed and to pause. And, you know, have you, have you seen that in our society, the victim mentality? My parents abused me 50 years ago. My spouse hurt me 30 years ago. I was made fun of when I was in elementary school 40 years ago. Like we said, we remember these things, right? But we can't allow these things to paralyze us. But when our society said, oh, poor you. Oh, poor you. You know, you were hurt in the past. and Oh, let's just continue this victim mentality rather than trying to be healed. Joseph could have allowed his 20 years of pain to define his life. He could have sunk down low and just kind of walked around moping. He could have called himself a victim. Instead, he became a victor. He began taking steps based on who he really was. God made him the prime minister of the land. He made his brothers subservient to him. 
<clears throat> Therefore, in verse 25, he gave orders to deal with his brothers in a harsh way. He gave orders to fill their grain bags with grain and to restore every man's money back to him. Instead of being mean, he blessed them, right? In verse 26, he sent them out. And when they came to the next rest stop, they looked at their bags and, wow, our money has been restored. And then notice what Joseph does to bless them. He stepped out of the cage to give them money to go back to get their brother. And then he wanted to bless them on the way back. Is it easy to bless someone that's hurt you? Oh, absolutely not. But we need to move to that phase of healing. So, Dave, I'm sure you and Kristen go shopping at Myers together a lot. I just see you as a couple that, that you push that golf, that, that golf cart, that, that grocery cart around. And, you know, I see these loving couples go through Myers. It's really a cute, quaint little thing, but I don't do that with Carla. But so I'm just going to say you guys do that, okay? <laughs> Can you see Dave and, and uh, Kristen doing that? No. No? no? Okay. Well, you're going to do it anyway. <laughs> <coughs> so you go to Myers in the afternoon, and you're having that special moment, you know, looking at cookies and pizzas or whatever it is. And you buy a whole month's supply of food. You load it all in the back of the van, and you get home. And, Dave, I'm sure you're the kind of guy that you will stand with your wife and put all the groceries away, just like I do when my wife comes home with the groceries. Okay, right? Sure. Sure, okay. <laughs> and as you're unloading those bags of groceries, all of a sudden in the bottom of the bag, you find all the money that you spent on groceries in the bottom of that bag. $300, $400. How are you going to react? You're, you're looking we're at each other. We're excited, like, but we feel obligated to take it back like something. Like some, but then you take it back and they say, no, it's yours, it's your gift. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be great? Yeah, yeah you'd go back again, right? Yeah, I want to go back now. <laughs> you know, if we realized it was a gift back to us, we'd say, praise God, you know, God is good to us. But what happened to the brothers instead? They looked at all the gifts that they were given to them. Like, what has God done to us? You know, they give praise to God. You know, those brothers were confused when they experienced grace. Grace doesn't have to be confusing, my friends. Grace is being forgiven for what we have done and say you're set free. Joseph was showing them grace by forgiving them. Joseph chose grace. He chose to step out of the cage of pain and bless his brothers. Have we experienced grace? Yes. Grace isn't confusing. It's not hard to understand. It's God blessing us. And because God has blessed us, my friends, we're called out to step out of that cage and bless <clears throat> others. Now here's the truth to remember. The people in the past who hurt you can no longer hurt you unless you allow them to. Did you get that? Say it again. The people in the past who have hurt you can no longer hurt you unless you allow them to. It's an attitude of our mind. You see, every time you rehearse it over and over and again in your mind, you're allowing them to hurt you. But we need to step on beyond that. In Psalm 37, it says, Let go of the anger. Let go and leave your rage behind. Do not be preoccupied with it because it only leads to evil. Yes? When we're sitting there having our little pity parties, it always leads to something bad. Resentment and bitterness and holding on to your hurt and being preoccupied with it over and over again lets that person that hurt you 20 years ago continue to hurt you today. Do you think that person's even thinking about you today? No. Probably not. And yet we keep on thinking about it, right? Don't let them hurt you anymore. Don't be preoccupied with it. Choose grace. You can't face the future with confidence 
if you're always rehearsing and refreshing in your mind over and over again all the bad things that have been done to you. Give it up. Live in grace. So how do you do that? How do you let go of your wounds? The only way to let go is to forgive. There's no other antidote out there for your heart than to forgive. Yes? Yes. But you might say, oh, Brad, you don't understand what they did to me. They don't deserve it. But neither do you. Don, do you deserve to be forgiven? How about it, Cindy? Do you deserve to be forgiven? Jeremy, do you deserve to be forgiven? But God forgave you. How dare we say that they don't deserve it? We need to forgive people for two reasons, or three reasons. The one says that God says to do it, right? The second reason is that God has already forgiven us, yes? And the third reason is it leads to healing in our lives. Resentment doesn't hurt them. It only hurts you. In Job chapter 18, it says, you are only hurting yourself with your anger. Right? You're only hurting yourself, so we've got to let go. So this morning, ask yourself the same question the brothers asked one another. What is it that God's doing in my life? You know, I know what he's done in your life. It was done in Calvary. And Jesus Christ has set you free and free indeed. He has given you a new identity. And he says, you're my kid. Maybe you heard this children's story about the eagle and the, and the prairie chicken. Anybody know that story? Come on, you old farmers out there. <laughs> Randy, you certainly heard the story of, of the eagle and the prairie chicken, haven't you? No? Mike, certainly you. I look like a farmer? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, one day, a prairie chicken, you know what a prairie chicken is, right? No, oh, what's a prairie chicken? <laughs> you guys are just beyond help. You know, they just kind of, prairie chicken is just a wild chicken that you know you kind of see out in the prairies and they're kind of a free range chicken, free range chicken, shall we say? Okay. Well, he found an egg and uh, he sat on it until it hatched. And unbeknown to this prairie chicken, the egg was an eagle's egg, abandoned for some reason from this eagle. That's how an eagle became to be born in the family of prairie chickens. So that eagle is I'm a, part of it. I'm a prairie chicken right now. While the eagle is while the eagle is the greatest of all birds, soaring above the heights, you know we all see the eagles. They fly with grace and ease. Can prairie chickens fly? No. No. In fact, prairie chickens are so lowly that they they'll peck around and eat the garbage on the ground. Well, predictably, this little eagle, being raised by the prairie chickens, walked around and and ate garbage just like the prairie chickens do. Okay. But well, one day as that eagle was pecking around eating garbage and little bugs on the ground, he looked up in the up in the sky and he saw this majestic bald eagle soaring through the air and dipping and turning and soaring. And when he asked his family of prairie chickens, he says, what is that? They said, well, that's an eagle. <clears throat> but you can never, ever be like that because you're a prairie chicken. Then they returned, pecking at the garbage on the ground. That little eagle spent his whole life looking at all the eagles flying around, wanting to join them among the clouds. But he never did because he was told he was a prairie chicken. chicken. It never occurred to him to lift up his wings and fly. And that eagle died a prairie chicken. So what's the moral of the story? If you're an eagle, don't spend your life in the chicken coop. Listen to this. You guys were born to fly. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. We all know it. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up their wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
You guys have been created to soar and do great things. Joseph could not stay in the coop of his own pain. He knew that he had to forgive his brothers. How about you? Today, your homework. Who are you going to forgive? How many here have people that have hurt us? Are you going to forgive them? Soar high. And allow God to set you free. And do something amazing in this place. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day that you've given to us and the word from Joseph. And how you worked in his heart and did some amazing things. Father, bless us this morning that as we looked deeply in his heart and saw his anger and saw his pain, as he recognized his brother, as he talked harshly to them, but also as he turned around and did something really amazing. Father, help us to be forgiven. We've all been hurt. We've all faced those times. Help us not let that pain eat at us. Let us step out of that cage and be forgiving and let others touch our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This amazing grace is something, isn't it? That's what grace is all about. Unearned, unearned, and it's for us. Go with that amazing grace. Go out to the world and share that. Forgive, and people will forgive you. Go with the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.